Hello, welcome to another Board Game Exposure interview. Today I'm joined by Paul Fronsdorf Harris. I should have messed up Harris, that would have been genius. Uh, to talk about Scrumpy the Card Game. Now, you have uh, the company Invincible Games with your graphic designer, Denham Spur. So talk to us about how you go from being a board gamer to someone who says, I can do that, and uh, you end up with a cider-based board game. So I guess I got into board gaming maybe only six, seven years ago. Um, I got went through the route of I started playing lots of Settlers of Catan with some friends and playing lots of um, we then played the Risk Legacy okay. and that was that was our way into the new world because we played Risk Legacy mm. and we loved it and we went this is different from games we played before so I so I literally I went home and looked on the internet and so what what's out there and we found the UK Games Expo and on a whim okay. I just started texting it it was it must have been about three weeks away and I said. <laughs> Do you fancy it? And he went, yeah. So we booked tickets and we went to the UK Games Expo. And that was our... So we knew at the time we went, this must have been probably seven years ago, I went to my first UK Games Expo knowing only, having played only Settlers of Catan and Risk Legacy Brilliant. and then games when I was a child. We played a lot... My, my family played a lot of games, but then that I discovered... That the one I dragged my friend along to who would have had a similar experience to you, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's exactly that. We, we went there and we just booked in for the whole weekend and we went, we're, we're doing this. And we went up on the front and we just stayed in the, the hotel up there, the little <laughs> holiday inn and we just went, went there. It was just like we were properly in a... Uh, children in a candy store. And then I've always been someone who's quite creative and I started to have ideas for games. Having When I started playing lots of games and, and mm. I joined groups and started travelling to different conventions, I started going down to the, the board game playing conventions as well as the... Because the thing I loved about the Expo was was the playing conventions. Then I started, I, as you know, I set up my own convention and um, that was quite popular and um, Handicon, if anyone's ever heard, not, not, no, never heard of it. But check <laughs> it out once, once, once we're all allowed out. But... Um, through that, I started to get a, a, a desire to design games. I had lots of ideas, so I um, I just started playing around with ideas. And uh, at, at Aircon, about four years ago, I was starting to play around with this idea I'd had for car using cards as resources as well. So I'd thought about different ways. Why would you have cards as resources? Well, you need a setup, which is a small game where you've got resources that the work is a small group of workers and a small group of resources, and that's where Scrumpy started to come out, out from. And it, when I first played it, I, I clearly have been inspired by things like Dominion and er, earlier deck building games, some of the earlier deck building games yeah, that yeah. I played. And so it was a pool of different workers that you chose to add to your deck and you built, built up by choosing the cards. And gradually it's evolved into more of a deck manipulation game, which is what we're calling the mechanic and, and it, there will be other games that feature a similar mechanic but it's not deck building in the sense that you maybe only add five to, to ten cards to your deck the entire okay. game but it's how you get those cards back around and get them out and there are different mechanisms you are you going to try and get nearly all your deck stored as resources yeah. and then play with the few cards you've got left or are you going to try and get them all through quickly and in and okay. out and then in and out and then just what have I got now? Oh, I'll play that. And so there's various different ways through the game. You can manipulate cards to be in your hand when you want it. You can hold a card back for when it's really efficient. Okay. And so that's why I, I've just waffled there. I should not have had a talk <laughs> before, before we started talking. My, my one worry on this interview was don't talk too much. Just that's good. Just speak a little bit. But um, I, um, so in answer to your actual question, how did I start getting into design? I just started designing games. I just started playing around with ideas. Um, I worked on a game called Reforestation, which is not dead in the water, but it's it's shelved for the moment because unfortunately it didn't fund on Kickstarter. I did very well. It was my first ever a game, and it did yeah. six that six and a half thousand out of a goal of nine thousand. But unfortunately, there were some problems with the campaign. It wasn't as the campaign wasn't as I would have liked it, and so the company that was doing it, we parted ways. Um, we, we, uh, and decided not to publish it. And I, it's something I still own the rights to. But then Scrumpy was the first thing I decided, you know, I'm going to take this forward myself. Okay. I'd like to be a designer who then designs for other companies or for myself. Yeah. But I wanted to learn the ropes of everything. I wanted to see everything that, that makes the big wheel work. And yeah. obviously it's quite daunting, but um, I went down to working three days a week instead of five days a week. I'm, I'm a math teacher. Yeah. And so what that gives me, and I know that there's some very famous 
um, designers like like Reiner, who are maths based in the, in 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 their, in their backgrounds, and I love the maths behind the game and the building of the the different mathematical problems that are not necessarily visible on the surface of the game. That they're my problem rather than the gamer's problem, and it's trying yes. to sort of give the gamer that sort of sense of seeing having fun where I've made all the maths work underneath to You've make got that the spreadsheets they don't have yeah. to see them <laughs> so yeah, exactly that did, it sounded like mechanics came first on scrumpy is that the case or was it your addiction I to think cider? it was a bit of both because I'm a big I, I love the idea of thematic euros hmm. where a lot of euros I, the themes are accused of being pasted on I don't think that's always fair I don't think it is always the case but hmm. I'm a big fan of I want people to play Scrumpy and feel like they've, pre they've made cider. Even though you haven't literally feel like they've pressed the thing, I want them to feel like, what did you do? I, when they say, I don't want them to say, oh, I put some cards in and got some points. Mm. I want them to feel like, yeah, well, I made cider and then I sold the cider and got points. And I, and so theme, theme is important to me. But there's also the argument that many people will make that, that it, it, it is really a setting because when you press cider, you don't take your cards and press them. There's no actual pressing of, of, of cards. It It's trying to bridge that sort of Euro mechanics and th theme as well. And so cider is it's an interesting one because someone said to me, oh, so you must be a big cider drinker then. And I said, well, actually now I'm teetotal. <laughs> and they're like, what? Your, dessert, your first game is about cider. And I'm like, well, I always used to drink lots of cider. And I'm not strictly teetotal in the, in the most strictest sense. I, I, I have maybe three, four drinks a year, but I drank enough at university, I think, to sort of last me a lifetime. And then I think I'm just trying to space it all out and let my liver recover a bit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's 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 one of those things. I haven't really answered your question again, but yeah, I, I think what came first was more trying to think of how which mechanics would work for that theme. Hmm. without it being theme-driven mechanics, yeah. if that makes sense. And it's been around in various forms for a bit now, hasn't it? So um, Yeah, I was at the UK Games Expo in 2017 with it. Yeah. So uh, there there are, if you look at the BGG page, there are video reviews of the two, uh, either 2017, 2018, <laughs> BG, uh, the, uh, the game, Board Games Expo. I was there with it, um, I've been there three years with it different having to having tables there um because it's evolved and it's had play mats and lots of people have tried it but the di the difference is so we we sat down and i was going to be publishers I, I was going to be like look i'm a guy in my in my bedroom who's come mm. up with a game go on kickstarter so it had that level of development it, i i'd play tested it 200 times we've done some blind play testing and then I managed to get Paul Grogan involved in helping with the rule book, uh, 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 who's a friend of mine, and so he was able to help with that, and that added a layer of professionalism. And then Denham came on board, and we suddenly realized, instead of me being a guy who's doing this, we were a company putting a game on. And suddenly, mm. when you're a company, the game needs to be a slightly higher standard. So then we had to do, redevelop, do some more development. So it's kind of this spiral of development that has gone through the game to try and make it more appealing and more enjoyable and uh, so that's invincible games yes which is a bold a bold name well it's it, it it's a game a name that came about with me and my brothers were trying to come up with a name for the company because i am a big fan of leonardo da vinci it's very okay. much like myself leonardo da vinci there are some other less savory things about him because he's from years and years and years ago but he was very well known as being sort of slightly ADHD, slightly like all these creative ideas. He, he's designing helicopters. He's, he's a painter. He's got a finger in many, many pies. And it kind of is someone I aspire to be. Some people have like footballers that they want to be like, and some people have like film stars. And I want to be like Leonardo da Vinci. So. A pie fingerer. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's go with that. We'll go with that. Pretend, <laughs> pretend that yeah. Leader that's, of that's the so Turtles. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... He's a bit of a hero of mine, so I want. So I thought it was quite cool having the word Vinci being inside Invincible, and it's like, so it came ah, from there. Ah, yeah. So not just maths, that's like English as well. Wordplay, yeah. A little, yeah. little, little, little wordplay. I love a pun. So in Vinci, so Invinci Bull. Yeah, Invincible, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, so 
with the revisions, how has that been for you as a designer? Because I know, like, probably like many gamers, I've had ideas, I've even prototyped some, and um, I remember the first prototype I worked on, I just showed my friends, and one of them was really bold with his feedback, and I wasn't quite ready for that, and it, re it was really difficult. And now, years later, when I returned to it, I actually made the changes he suggested, and it works better. Um, but how has that been difficult to see it go through revisions, or has that been is that something that kind of do you get energy from that? I think it's interesting. I benefited a great deal from being a mathematician stroke scientist in my background, in that I view it as a constantly iterative process. Okay. So you're constantly striving towards a better game, hmm. and I'm. I'd go so far as to say I'm a bit too far the other way. I make too many changes, so I will respond to pretty much every person I play test okay. with feedback. And occasionally, I've had to go. I've, I've moved this game too far away from the from the what was good, what was good about this game, and I'm I'm trying to pander a bit too much because you get some people with quite extreme like opinions. Oh, this would be much better if there was a horse in it and stuff. Yeah. And you're like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll we'll put a horse in it. And then a few months later, you're like, why has this got a horse in it? Oh, because Barry that I met in Scarborough liked horses, but. It's more, I like the idea of this sort of spiral of constant improvement. I put things in, brought them out, and then they brought them back six months later. And then, so I love that element to it and the game constantly evolving. And it's kept it fresh for me because yeah. the game I'm playing and playtesting now is not the game I was playtesting years ago, but I can see it's quite a bit better. And it's been very nice playtesting recently with some people who playtested it two years ago because obviously we're doing all the playtesting online, I finally got around to getting it onto Tabletop Simulator, and I've been able to do quite a lot of playtesting. Mm. And people going, oh, I'm really liking this. Like, I liked it before, but this is really... Um, like, I can see how much more of a, a game it is now and how much more refined it is. Um, but I've, I've got boxes on my shelf, like, in front of me here, where I've got games which I've shelved, but I will want to start working on. So... I want to work on a game, um, I've got a, a Euro, quite an ambitious Euro that I want to work on um, about designing and building a zoo. And I know there's a few zoo games that have come out that are a bit lighter recently. So like Uwe Roger Thunberg had New York Zoo. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another one, zoo, Zooography. Yeah. Um, but they're a little bit lighter. And this is more of a, a sort of quite medium to heavy Euro. Okay. And I've got other things like there's one about tin mining in Cornwall. So there are constantly ideas. But then I think some part of it as a designer, you have to go, right, I'm going to take this and sort of iterate it and work it, work on it and work on it. And I, it's been helpful. I mean, I, I just I just need to be, be careful. I don't drop too many, too many names on the floor. But like, I've, I, I've shared a room with uh, David Turtsey at um, yeah. Aircon. And it was really nice seeing his, A, his approach to design, having conversations with him about his approach to design. He's spoken to me about some of the ideas I've had and the games design I've, I've had. And having people like that, has been really helpful. I was lucky enough to have Vit uh, Vitello Lacerda play okay. tested Strumpy at, um, at GridCon. And so having nice. him give it, so the reason there's a storehouse board, so there's a, the, the storehouse boards that we use, this was an idea that came from Vitello Lacerda. So the, uh, he said, well, it would be quite nice to have a board where everything goes. And I thought, sort, of, sort of thought about it, we built it, and, and it worked really well. So, like, I, should, I guess I should give him guest credits in some, in some form, but it was just like it was the conversation we'll we had. We'll keep out his name so no one knows. Yeah, and, and so, and I, 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 I'm a big believer that you just, you sometimes just have to start start conversations with things. So I, I had a really nice positive email conversation with Jamie Stegmaier about the game, and he's actually, um, I, I, has said that he was going to be looking out for it on Kickstarter, not necessarily will back it, but he's certainly interested in the theme, mm. interested in it. And those sorts of things have been really reassuring, sort of speaking to people. Um, Tony Boydell, again, I brought it to a games night, and Tony, Tony is a friend of mine who sometimes comes to our board game night on a Monday night, and he really liked elements of it as well. And so that's really reassuring. So they give you pointers as well, and uh, and so seeing people who've had success, it can also inspire sort of further development and 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 keep you sort of feeling that this is going to go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, so let's talk Kickstart then. You've um, done one Kickstarter before, you said? I've been involved in a campaign once before. You've been involved I, in a campaign. I haven't run anything on my own, so okay. I, I have been the designer on one, where, which was run by other people. Yeah. This is the first one I've run myself. So, so how, if, this one, if, this, if this one fails, this is on me. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how are you feeling uh, going into it? Yeah, it's two weeks away, and I'm, I'm counting every day. It's um, I think I'd be... I'm quite happy with how it's going. We're in the throes of 
this weekend, sort of after I've finished this, we've, I've got a couple of demos with American uh, reviewers on Tabletop Simulator, which is quite nice. And then I'm also going to spend the rest of the weekend recording little video snippets that are going to start drip feeding onto Facebook and sort of teaser trailers and little character driven videos. And then we're working on the Kickstarter video as well. So I've got a, uh, a video a videographer, I guess that's called, a video editor maybe, uh, who's going to help put that together. Um, so it's we're doing. I've got lo, I've got a, a lovely long list of all the things I want to achieve. I wanted to get done, and it does feel like a very long list. But I am chipping away at it. Okay. Uh, I think it's it's a weird scenario where I, I I love teaching. I've been a teacher for sixteen years, but I kind of am resenting being at school a little bit because I'm <laughs> like, I, I've got thick. I've got Kickstarter stuff to be doing. So when when Jeff Smith is saying to me, "Oh, I'm still, I hate maths," and I'm like. Just shut up, because I, I, I want to be at home doing my, my kickstart <laughs> trainer at the moment, and you're, you're telling me, oh, I don't want to do maths. It's like, no, so, we're going to learn about adding fractions today, and like, for the 17th time, this, it's like, <laughs> like, yes, this is how we add fractions, and I'm like, oh, God, it'd be nice if I could, was at home doing more design stuff, but so you're launching, I'm excited. Yeah, and you're launching on the 4th of... 4th, yes. April. We've made the... Some Easter. people have... I mean, Paul, Paul Grogan said to me, this is a, a crazy decision to launch on Easter Sunday. It's like... <laughs> If anyone was telling you when shouldn't you launch, it would probably be a, a Sunday in the middle of a, of, a, of a a bank holiday weekend. And I'm like, well, look, I love the idea of launching on the fourth of the fourth, mainly because when I put out the fourth of the fourth, both English and Americans will know that it's the same same <laughs> date. So That's that gives me the, the option of the fourth of the fourth, the fifth of the fifth, or the sixth of the sixth. And 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 equally, like I, it's going to be live for for three weeks. Okay. If people like the game, they're going to see it. Mm. I know in Kickstarter you get a lot of traction if you're if you're back in the first few de- few days, but I'm not a company coming with an army of legion of fans coming to Kickstarter going look let's fund this game that we're, we've already got boxes of it you can have it pretty much straight away. <laughs> I am someone who's we've not been able to print it yet because we need the Kickstarter to fund the game. Yeah. So I'm coming and if I have a drip feed and if my my um thing is a little bit more of a straight line but it gradually just gets us to the funding level, I'm happy. Um, I'd like to back to, to fund after three hours, like some of these games do. I'll be honest with you, I'm we're, I'm testing the water. I, I don't know what it's going to be like. I I hope people like what we're putting out. I hope people want to see more. I I, I I'm willing to do tabletop simulator demos with any backer uh, through the through the campaign. So anyone who Brilliant. backs, uh, and even if they back for a pound and say, look, I'd like to try the game, I'm willing to sort of schedule throughout those two weeks because I've got two weeks of the I've done it I've scheduled it so it's the start of the Easter holidays for yeah. me so I can at any time of the day I'm, I'm willing to get up at four in the morning and do a demo with someone in Macedonia <laughs> or or get up at six, six uh, uh, get up at one in the morning and do a demo with someone in Chile I, I, I don't mind I just want to give everyone a chance to see see for themselves and I find it very difficult because I don't want to sell people a game that they they might not want. I only want people to back it because they like the game. So I yeah. want to get the game image, and I'm kind of trying to sell myself a little bit because the game is made by myself, and I want them to get my enthusiasm across and and those sorts of things. So tell us about how you're approaching uh, pledge levels, stretch goals, that sort of thing. So there's there's two things. What well, two things we're doing that are a bit different. So. I'm very much of the, of the opinion that I want the game that you back for on Kickstarter to be the game that is available for retail. Mm-hmm. What we're looking into doing at the moment is having a pack that you can buy that comes with all the Kickstarters. Yeah. A small pack. So things like the stretch goals and stuff would be in a pack that comes with your game, but that pack is bought separately at retail, maybe okay. for four, yeah. four pounds or five pounds, so that it's available. But there's a feeling that doing the Kickstarter was better because you got that pack of extras yeah. early. So everyone got the game, but the pack of extras came. So we're looking... I don't want to feel like, oh, it's only a good game if we fund way beyond funding funding level. Yeah, yeah. I want it to be a good game with good uh, standards. Um, I, I We can't, at the moment, afford to split it into a, a standard and deluxe. So we're trying to make it a halfway house that's pretty deluxe already. Yeah. With Because... Obviously, we can only afford, we, we don't know what sort of level of print, print run we're going to be able to do. We'd love to do a print run of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. We may be trying to do 1,500. We just don't know. Um, so with that in mind, the stretch goals, we're going to try and make them quite semi, semi-regular with lots of little things. But there'll be some stretch goals that are a bit different from most stretch goals. Our artist is currently at college. She started this when she was 13, the, art, the artist, <laughs> the, the game. 
she genuinely, she was in year eight. I, I approached her through her dad. I saw the art she was doing at, at, at Aircon, spoke to her through her dad, and her dad, her dad supported her. So I, I communicate with her through her dad all, all the time. And, and she's, she's incredible for her age. She's currently at, at college. And so we're trying to, so we're, she'll be doing some obviously more art to, to go with the, the, some of the pledge levels of, uh, we've got a pledge level, which is having your face in the game. Okay. Um, so we've got 10 different pledges of this, of this available. Um, somewhere somewhere around 100 120 pounds but you get to be in the game as well so you get a copy of the game but you get you get a a, 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 a a proper picture made of you that she's that she's done as well and then you'd feature in the game as one of the characters that everyone everyone uses um and that's been a, a, so one of the things I want to have as a stretch goal is, is that her percentage goes up slightly so it's very much like if we reach this point, I'm 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 going to not gain anything. I'm not going to gain any money. And actually, at this on this level, maybe it'll be like uh, between sixteen thousand, eighteen thousand, maybe. Yeah. This level is not necessary for the people buying to feel, to get a bit more to the game. But this point, she gets an extra one percent or anything. Oh, nice. So something that yeah. helps her with her college money or something like that. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. Feel that there's a it's a huma humanitarian privilege yeah. level. It's something that helps her as a person and rewards this young up and coming artist to try and. Obviously, she's been paid, but to get a bit more out of yeah. it. Yeah, that's cool. So having a few things like that has been something I wanted to wanted to do to make because it's a bit different. It's it's about using Kickstarter. We we define our own ways of using Kickstarter, right? It's like it doesn't have to always be the same campaigns. Everyone tries to clone each other's campaign. We can try yeah. our own things, and Definitely. if it doesn't work, I'll put my hands up and say there'll be some ideas that I've tried that didn't work, but. It's about seeing what works and, and, and saying, look, what I want to do is fund the game and, ha and have it available for people around the world. And I've got a core of maybe 20 or 30 that will be backing from New Zealand because my brother uh, lives in New Zealand and he, he's a <laughs> member of a games group out there. So he's got people out there and he's speaking to like, New Zealand board game groups and things out there. So Excellent. that that will be a, 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 a shipping issue. I don't, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to... Not going to worry about until we. So that obviously, the more people, the closer they are to Auckland, the better, because I can ship them all to him and say you deal with it. But, <laughs> but like, there's there's little in th things like that. I'm trying to engage the community if possible. I want to, I want to make the campaign as interactive as possible. We're yeah. going to be having some people might call it fun, some people might call it annoying, but we're going to have it having uh, coming up with pun names for some of the characters and stuff because I'd like it if. So we've got some good ones. We've got some. Less good ones, uh, <laughs> and so uh, at the moment I'm working on uh, the the video for the recruit re recruitment consultant, and um, he was uh, he was uh, uh, called uh, something to do with staff. I can't remember, even remember his name now. It's, it, I was, but um, yeah, it, it, it's just coming up with different names and things and and things that make people interested in what's going on and and, and have a bit of a smile when they're playing. Because that's very much my my personality as well. So, wanting people to have the same sort of uh, experience as me of, of oh, that's a terrible joke, but it's a joke, a laugh around the table for from it and stuff. So, sorry, so forgive like, me on my other screen. Trying to see if I can find subtitle the subtitle uh, on the Kickstarter page that says the core of the game. For absolutely. Well, we, our core values will definitely <laughs> be on there, um, and and we will we'll be trying to appeal to as many yeah. different people as possible. Yeah. And it's a game about insider trading. So, um, <laughs> yeah, trying to think of one with Pip. Well, the last I'm question sure, I usually sure ask people, I'm going to ask you, and that is, a year or so from now, the games have all been sent out. You're hearing wonderful stories about them fulfilling. Uh, what is on the cards at that point for Invincible Games? Do you already have another Kickstarter going? Are so, you... my my vision is. If we're looking at wildest hopes, my wildest hopes are that this will be successful enough that I could even take a sabbatical from teaching for a year and, inv and grow Invincible Games so that in September uh, we're looking, we're preparing to launch maybe a November Kickstarter okay. for for a big Euro, and then we start to try and build on that success by doing a smaller game and a bigger game each year. Okay. Um, I think it's very important because. I've had a couple of people who've, who've heard about Scrumpy Card Cider and gone, oh, it's a small card game, and it's very important that I sort of get that. And they then tried it and went, there's loads more meat than this. This is a medium weight game. This is, there's, there's lots of strategy here. This is 
people who are like like heavy games or like this because it's one of those that once you learn the rules, there's depth to it. There's it's little puzzles constantly, not complicated puzzles, but constant little puzzles that you're constantly. Oh, how do I get the presser here? I want the presser in my hand, but he's currently an apple. But if I need the, need to use him to make that apple into a silo, so I need to get him back somehow. So I need to use. Oh, I need. I can use this action to get him. So there's a lot of hidden depths to the game. So I think. But what we want to do is have like a small box game and then a medium weight euro or a, a slightly heavier game each year. And so okay. I want to grow I want to grow the company and, and ideally this time next year I'll have two games that people are uh, people are starting to re- have received their first one. There's people have backed the campaign for the second one and they're excited about it. Maybe we're even looking into doing our first game that isn't on Kickstarter because I'd like to sort of dovetail and have some that goes into retail first so that Okay. I, I want to use Kickstarter to grow a community and I want to use Kickstarter to get the funding to be able to make games mm. if the pro- profits were sufficient to grow the company to allow the funding of a game without Kickstarter that would be used good as well because I think I, I really like the model that Stone My Games have used where they, they moved away from Kickstarter once they felt that they could fund the games themselves yeah. Yeah. but I still don't think there's a, a bad thing about using Kickstarter for the community no. and yeah. for the providing people some, a different experience yeah yeah and I've seen that with um, Folded Space as well of course the inserts where they did the three campaigns and then they just sent out this email like oh we're moving away from Kickstarter now but again they've toyed with going back for different things you know like yeah. different elements so so yeah I think that's uh, I remember going oh much respect you know it's, it's good that you've kind of got that ethos well listen Paul thank you very very much uh for chatting to me. I know you've got to uh, get off and see your Granny Smith uh, and then see tend to your pink lady. Uh, so... Uh... <laughs> I was about to say I'm going to go and look after my, my, my 11-month-old uh, daughter is not, has not been very well, blessed. her. She's got a cold, so I was going to go and cuddle her. And then you told me I'm going to go and play with my pink lady. I'm, yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm going to leave that one there, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to pie fingering. That's much better. <laughs> um, do uh, so. It's fourth of fourth of the fourth. Wherever fourth you live in the world, that is yes, true. Absolutely. Fourth of the fourth. Um, do check it out. There'll be a link under this video in the comments, in the title, wherever I can squeeze it to the notify me page, which will turn into the Kickstarter page. So do grab that and look out for more videos from us appearing on Board Game Expose and Board Game Exposure. Thanks very much, and thanks to Paul. Bye now. Thank you.